Yes, uh, diabetes, many things in common with older people. And I am the chairman of this working group and I welcome you personally also again that you have come here. And this, uh, this uh, course is very important for our working group and I hope so that it is also for you. Now, uh, this is my conflict of interest. And uh, just to begin with long-term consequences of diabetes, you are very much aware that uh, there is a microangiopathy which we allude to the glucose, so it's retinopathy, neuropathy, nephropathy. And it is clear that you can control for that in part by reducing glucose. But the other question is what is with macroangiopathy, which uh, you could term also atherosclerosis, and which is the cause of coronary artery disease of peripheral and cerebrovascular disease. And this is now perhaps the first answer to the next uh, slide, namely the session objectives. Why do we speak about diabetes in cardiology? It is because we have this macroangiopathy and we are not sure that we can control that by controlling glucose. So what I will show you in this session is uh, the fields of innovation by some late breaking trials from last year. And perhaps you will, uh, during the, the whole talk, you will consider whether I show you class effects or not. And that is very important for, for a pharmacological approach to patients with diabetes and heart disease. So it is interesting to look at class effects, but not only to look at class effects. If you try to compare trials, uh, you compare apples with oranges probably, because there are differences between trials that you may consider. And that is, of course, different drugs, but more importantly, perhaps different populations. And one, one trick to, uh, to look at a class effect or not is to look at the placebo branch in every trial. And if you see that in trial A, the placebo events are more than in, in trial B, then you have a higher risk population in the uh, trial A. So, this is a very good trick to look into data in more the detail. Then you can look at the entry criteria, at the trial size, and at the trial duration. And then you can assess whether the trials are comparable and assess whether you have a class effect. So this is the overall considerations I want to share with you now. And we now look in more details. And what you see here is a timeline from 1961 to uh, 2012. And uh, there were several trials uh, in which there was a concern of harm with glucose lowering drugs. And this brought uh, the FDA and the EMA to new requirements that when you have a new diabetes drug, you have to demonstrate at least safety in diabetic patients because in these older trials with tolbutamide, with muraglitazar, with rosiglitazion, there, was a, there, there were signals that the drug does not only not improve macrovascular outcome, but deteriorated. Although it, of course, uh, uh, does uh, improvement on microangiopathy endpoints. Now, uh, what is now to be considered is three fields of innovations we had the last year. It's GLP-1 receptor agonists, it's DPP-4 inhibitors, and I think the most interesting uh, class of drugs is the SGLT2 inhibitors. You know all these, and uh, I would like to start with something different, and here you see the the population that was studied. And for cardiology, it is important to look how many percent had already cardiovascular disease. And you see here empiric outcome and ELIXA had 100% and for example, Canvas had only 65% baseline cardiovascular disease. 
So before judging whether there is a class effect, we look at the populations and we see different populations in different studies, so probably not comparable. Next, you need not read that, this is just from 2013 uh, to now, and you see if you count the fields here, these squares or rectangles, then you see now is the time where we have a hype of such diabetes trials. So it's just a very actual topic to look at, uh, at cardiovascular outcome trials in diabetes. So this is where we live now, very interesting time. Now let us go into the first class, GLP-1 receptor agonists. Uh, they increase insulin secretion, they decrease glucagon secretion, they decrease um, gastric emptying, and they have central nervous effects, all ending up with better glucose control. And now we want to see whether this better glucose control also affects cardiovascular outcome. And if we summarize that in a short time, which we want to allude to that, is that we have two positive and two neutral outcome studies. The positive ones is I will focus more on leader because this is in lead of our considerations in diabetes. And you can say two are neutral, so they are not better than others. And I want to focus on that a little bit more. And perhaps you would conclude there is no class effect, but perhaps the populations are different. Now, look at leader first. Leader, and this is to be concise. Uh, these trials, like many in uh, lipidology, now try to do better that the, than the standard therapy, which means liraglutide plus the usual care, the best diabetes care you can offer versus pl placebo and the best therapy you can offer at this time. And then if you look at that, then you see there is a major difference in cardiovascular mortality. So this is a very good result, published in 2016, and you see the hazard ratio is 0.78, so this is a remarkable reduction in cardiovascular mortality by liraglutide, an injectable drug, of course, as the, these uh, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists are all uh, uh, injectable drugs. If you go further on to total mortality, and this is again a repetition of what endpoints we should look at, as, as Professor Rosano has just shown us before. Then you see, of course, total mortality is always a composite endpoint between different types of death, and this is always diluted. But here the dilution is not so much that we lose the significance between the lira and the placebo group. So very good trial, clearly positive. So uh, this is the first field of innovation we had the last uh, half decade. Now, DPP-4 inhibitors, they are the leaders in the market now in many European countries. So because they are very safe and they are well tolerated, and they uh, make a bit the same as the former uh, class of drugs, they just use, if you want to say that, use the endogenous GLP-1 and, and inhibit um, the, uh, the metabolism of, of GLP-1. But they are weaker, just to, to say that. And now we go back to cardiology and we see, well, we had three uh, published DPP-4 inhibitors and you see 2013 to 2015 and you see huge number of patients. Uh, inclusion was sometimes history of, mo or of multiple risk factors and ACS and in TICOS it was cardiovascular disease. And we make it short now and we overlay that, that there was non-inferiority met in all these trials with DPP-4 inhibitors, <coughs> but there was no cardiovascular disease benefit. Neutral, like the two uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists I showed you before, but not as good as leader and, and sustain. So uh, just uh, to look at the latest news uh, from Carmelina, which is uh, uh, another DPP-4 inhibitor, it's linagliptin that is mostly uh, excreted via 
uh, the liver and not via the kidney. Therefore, you can give it also to patients with, uh, with advanced kidney failure. Now, here you see hemoglobin A1 is reduced, so we do, no, we, we do not doubt that there is an improvement of microvascular complications if we observe that long enough, but the point is what is with macroangiopathy, and nothing happens with that, so it is not toxic. It's just like I said before, the, the equivalence is met, safety is met, but there is no improvement in cardiovascular disease outcome. And uh, this is for a, a three-point maze, you see it here, and it's for a secondary kidney outcome, it's the same. So safe, but not better than standard care. And if you look at some other points, you see here the three-point maze, the cardiovascular death, and if you focus on those two, you will conclude with me no significant difference in the risk for cardiovascular death, non-fatal stroke, non-fatal MI. That's what you see here. Good, DPP-4, uh, what can we conclude with this last trial? Uh, linagliptin did not increase the risk for the three-point maze. It did not affect the risk for all-cause mortality, and it did not affect the risk for hospitalization for heart failure. Uh, although there was a little non-significant signal for the last one, and there was a... Uh, uh, meta-analysis by Professor Rosano and his group that showed that TPP4 inhibitors are rather are not so good for hospitalization uh, for heart failure. And now we leave that group of compounds and go to the SGLT2 inhibitors. And there is the breakthrough trial uh, MPAREG outcome. Probably you all have read that. Just a little reminder, uh, not so large, medium size randomization to dosages, exactly the same effect, so we don't uh, consider the dosage anymore short, and the primary endpoint was death, myocardial infarction, and stroke. To be concise again, it is EMPA, gliflozin, plus the best available diabetes care versus uh, an EMPA, gliflozin, placebo, plus the usual care. So this is not a placebo-controlled trial. This is just a trial that shows what could we do better. And we will hear that afterwards from, from Professor Lewis about lipids. That is the time where we are. We know that we have good interventions, but we want to do it better than we can at the moment. And that, is, that was met here by the primary outcome that was significantly better with empagliflozin, although the trial was was uh, designed to show non-inferiority. It surpassed that prerequisite and w showed uh, majority or superiority and uh, quite, quite a nice reduction in relative and absolute risk. What was even more important was that the mortality rate was reduced so much. You see this is the cardiovascular mortality and this is at a relative risk of 0.62. So this is one out of three deaths does not occur, is prevented in comparison to the best currently treated diabetes. So this is very much better. And again, there is some dilution by uh, the way to look at total events and total uh, fatal events all cause or total mortality, and you see this is also excellent. 32% reduction in total mortality only over four years. So this is the hallmark of the new trials in diabetes, and you will probably, for the end of my talk, be interested, is there a class effect with other outcome trials that have just appeared last year? So we go to Kana, that was a bit more than a year ago, canagliflozin, another SGLT2 inhibitor. This is the time to say, what is SGLT2 inhibition? It's just uh, renal glucosuria, artificial renal glucosuria. The kidney does not reabsorb all of the filtered glucose and glucose together with water and sodium. The S of SGLT2 is for sodium, leaves the body. So you lose calories and so on. And uh, this is a bit larger than the one I showed you before, 
and it's very similar to that, but you have seen on, on one of the first slides, it's not totally cardiovascular disease. That was the big difference I wanted to point out. Now, if you look here at the primary endpoint, which is death from cardiovascular cause, non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke, a very good standard endpoint, and you see this is reduced, <coughs> and there is even superiority. And this superiority is good with a low number needed to treat. If we look then on specific endpoints, I think we could focus, and this is hospitalization for heart failure. This is reduced by, two, by one third, so very important effect. I just, one minute ago I said, these drugs act by delivering glucose out of the body together with water, so it's an osmotic diuretic. With that, you can perfectly explain that there is a reduced rate of hospitalization for heart failure. Now we go to the last one, which is just being published, dapagliflozin, the third SGLT2 inhibitor, and just to show that patients with congestive heart failure have a worse prognosis than patients without congestive heart failure, diabetic patients, we go on <coughs> and look what I just said at various surrogate endpoints, and of course it's a glucose-lowering drug, but by the diuretic effect and by the loss of glucose, of energy, it's also a weight-losing effect, and by the loss of sodium, isn't that easy? It's also a, a, a lowering in systolic blood pressure more than in diastolic blood pressure, but it's a little bit antihypertensive. This holds true also for empagliflozin and CANA, which I showed you before. And now if we look here at the endpoint of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, we see this is a class effect. However, if you look at the major acute uh, cardiovascular events, this difference is very small and did not reach significance. Here, you remember, it's not the same type of population. It's another population. It's the same approach to the kidney and to glucose lowering by this way. Next, uh, if we look at, uh, at renal endpoints, it takes some time, but the renal composite endpoint, which is a loss of glomerular filtration rate, new end-stage renal disease, renal death or cardiovascular death, this is better with dapagliflozin than with placebo. Fits very well into uh, the whole aspects. But total mortality is not different. It's not such a high-risk population as you have seen in the Empiric outcome trial. And if you look at a, a specific endpoint, you see cardiovascular death or hospitalization. If you take them together, it's significantly better. However, if you look further down, then you see the hospitalization carries, the hospitalization for heart failure carries this reduced risk and it is not the death from cardiovascular cause. So it's questionable whether one should combine those two if it is carried over only by one of the two. Just a critique on, on the way to present this data. Now, um, death from non-cardiovascular cause, it's the, the kidney problems here. This is very significantly reduced. This is within the typical context cardiovascular death or hospitalization. Here, at, why do I show you this slide? It's just to show the hazard ratio is the same for patients who have already disease or who have multiple risk factors. Consider that for a second, the hazard ratio. Well, the hazard ratio is dependent on the drug, but the absolute risk reduction is dependent on the population. So the hazard ratio will never be different between different populations. This is the hazard ratio trap we always find in, in outcome trials. Perhaps you have a question for that. Anyway, at the end, Canvas, I showed you before, uh, in comparison to empiric outcome was very effective for the three-point maze, but no death reduction and all cause mortality reduction. There is one more drug to come. It's ertugliflozine and you want to know from the, 
this session, upcoming and ongoing clinical trials. You see there is one, and we, we are very curious what is the outcome here. At the end, I can show you these drugs that have been beneficial, and in red you see what they have reduced in three-point maze, cardiovascular death, all-cause mortality, heart failure hospitalization, and doubling of serum creatinine, and this all was met by this drug. Many were reduced by Lira and a bit less so by Kana, but it was a different population. And here you see green fields, and this is the same as showed the last slide. You just see what type of endpoint was reduced significantly, and that is what you want to know. And of course, you have these slides available, so I don't go field by field. But uh, we can say the benefit in coronary artery disease is very well established for empagliflozin and liraglutide, and it's also a benefit in heart failure for EMPA. With that, uh, you see where we have ended. That's the summary. We have now many trials that have been beneficial, some only safe, but most also beneficial. And this has led us uh, with the leading author, Alexander Niesner, who, whom you have heard already today, to this, <clears throat> to this current opinion paper. And please read it. This summarizes very well why uh, looking at different drugs in diabetes therapy is worthwhile. And we concluded more than one year ago that you start with metformin. This is not, not a, a formal diabetes lecture, but you know that. And then we go to one of those that have proven that they reduce cardiovascular events. <clears throat> My last slide is, you have heard that once today, and you will hear it again, our working group has a very nice meeting also on diabetes drugs uh, in Vienna, May 17 to 18, and you are very welcome uh, to register already now. It's open for registration. Okay, with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm, of course, happy if you have questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>